Greetings, Zimbabwe, Africa, and the world. Welcome to In Conversation with Trevor, where I go beyond the headlines and beyond the sensational. Today, I am in conversation with Anthony Maniwanza, who is the Group Chief Executive Officer of Dairy Board Holdings, Zimbabwe. Anthony Mandiwanza, welcome to uh, In Conversation with Trevor. Thank you, Trevor. Um, so your payoff line is more than just milk. And, and, and yet a lot of people associate Daily Board with just milk. Can you unpack for us what other lines of products Daily Board is into? Thank you, Trevor. Um, the genesis of Daily Marketing Board as a state enterprise was to receive and process milk from the farmers and produce the traditional milk, pasteurized milk, cheese and butter. That was the main line uh, they produced then. During the transformation from 1991 to 1994, we commenced a, pro a process of uh, liberalizing the dairy industry and to let the dairy industry play a fuller role than just processing milk. We then decided in 1997 to look at outside the box, so to speak, and see what other lines can we produce, exploiting the synergies that existed in the factory through the process line. We came up with the three key pillars of the business. The foods, uh, which is now producing uh, uh, peanut butter, a mayonnaise, a salad cream, a, to mention just a few of those. And then we looked at the second pillar, is what we call the beverages. These are products which are low milk based uh, products, which includes the famous lines such as Fuko, uh, Cascade, uh, are some of the key product lines in the category of, uh, of beverages. And then of course the third pillar, is the, the traditional uh, milk, uh, fully milk-based product. That's where the more than just milk uh, payoff line comes from. And which, which part, which line contributes the biggest uh, to, your, to your business? The beverages are by far now the largest contributor to our business portfolio. So we, we're looking at your results uh, for the period ended 30 June. Uh, 2019. How would you characterize uh, the tr that trading period? The the trading period is split into two: January to the end of May, where we experienced both revenue growth and volume growth, and to a large extent stable, a relatively stable cost uh, cost line movement. Then after May following the announcement of significant changes that took place, we saw the downturn in terms of your volumes and your revenues, and we also experienced significant uh, uh, cost, cost movement relating, of course, to the exchange rate and the availability, scarcity, rather, of foreign currency. Um, so the period January to to May, we were very uh, confident about the trading and the trending. Then, of course, you have got uh, June onwards, uh, representing a much more turbulent uh, situation than was anticipated. So this is the Im negative impact of uh, policy changes that have been made. Uh, the currency, uh, then you've got issues around electricity, you have issues around uh, fuel. Uh, can you just uh, uh, sort of give us a, a, an analysis of which one was, had the biggest impact on the, on the business, as it were? In our business, in our business, because we rely f so much on electricity and producing what we call live products, uh, short shelf life products, which are extremely vulnerable to changes in the process line, any interruption with respect to the supply of electricity result immediately in losses in process and to a certain extent compromising 
your finished products which you can't put into the market. So that was a, that's a very significant uh, uh, issue, uh, electricity in our business. Then of course we had another challenge which is water. Um, traditionally we get our water from the municipalities and um, they've been un unable to supply consistently resulting in us having to buy water for processing. Wow. Now, just to give you a sense of size, uh, in the dairy industry, for milk and milk products and other related products that we produce, you need a relationship of two is to one. For every liter that you process, you need two liters of water. And, and we produced quite significant uh, volumes in excess of five million, six million a month. That tells you how much water we need. Now, can you imagine now buying most of it instead of getting it from the municipality? It becomes a big cost even. And where do you buy that water from? Well, we, there, are, there are quite a number of uh, uh, independent uh, suppliers of bulk water. Uh, some people who buy it, who, who buy it uh, from DEMA and other sources and come and sell to us. That's not a normal way of doing business. No, it's not normal. It's abnormal, mm -hmm. absolutely abnormal. But still, Anthony, you have been able to record pretty good results. Um, volume growth um, is up. You've seen raw milk intake up from 14% uh, last year to 22%. How have you been able to achieve those good results? The only side of the uh, raw milk side, which is a very critical uh, 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 issue for our business, it's a result of a number of initiatives which have been put in place uh, to specifically focus on what we call milk supply development agenda. Uh, we have invested significantly in res human resources where we now have in each catchment area of our business, five of them, we have a resident, a vet, who spent all his time or her time working with the farmers to assist on the animal husbandry, uh, farm management issues, uh, to enhance cost uh, as well as uh, to enhance quality and volume growth. As a result of those initiatives, we have actually begun to see an increase in the milk supply. So I think that, that, that is a long-term investment which is beginning to bear fruit. Let's turn to now something which is pretty <coughs> big for you. What's the status of the dairy head in the, in the country? Right, let's, let's roll back to 1990-91 as, as our baseline. Uh, in 1990-91, the country produced overall 260 million liters of uh, milk from the farmers per annum. Today, we are producing 75 million. So you can see the change from 260 to 75 uh, million. Second, the dairy head, in the same period, was 192,000 dairy head. Uh, today, it's just under 30,000. So those statistics tell you a huge change, a sea change actually, um, in, the, in the size of the dairy industry from that period to now. And that represent an opportunity zone. So tell me, what would be the strategy? What's the best way of addressing the critical shortage of the dairy head? Firstly, and secondly, the, 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 the gap between demand and supply for milk. What's the best strategy for addressing those two issues? Right, the, let, we start from the supply side. The dairy head can be lifted by way of uh, investing into what we call greenfield investments. Uh, looking at a bigger, high impact, low cost uh, investment that can be uh, put into the production side. That can be achieved through a tripartite, which is government, uh, private funding, and us as corporate to supply the back-to-back -back agreement for the offtake uh, of that uh, uh, initiative. If you do that, you will be able to set up big dairy producing senders uh, that will be able to produce milk much faster within a shorter period of time. Of course, the gestation period, you're looking up to about five years. So that uh, will address significantly the milk production. Experiences across the border in Zambia indicate that uh, 
that approach is born fruit. So the Zambians are already doing it. They are they're already they're doing seeing it. the results. Yes, that's right. Absolutely. They're what seeing. is it that you would want to see government doing to encourage to, to, to attend to the shortage of milk in the first instance and the growth of the dairy head? Right. The the on the growth of the dairy head, its ability to attract private funding. There are quite a number of interesting uh, investigation approaches which have been made so far uh, by people who are willing to invest directly into the dairy sector. But what is required is the security of that investment. If it is going to be a greenfield investment, there ought to be land available uh, for that purpose. Um, and we see a number of catchment areas. One in the middle sub, there is potential scope for a big greenfield investment that can be undertaken. There is an interest from a foreign funders to invest in such a project. So government comes on board and to provide the comfort that you need on security of that investment is critical. Ourselves to provide the back-to-back -back so that the milk is produced, we process it, we market it within the domestic and export market. Import substitution and export generation is a critical component for that uh, investment to take place. There is another uh, is a potential area uh, which involves a private uh, public listed company. I won't mention their names, mm -hmm. but they are quite interested to go into a mega project along the same model as I have alluded to, which involves our sales dairy board as the processor, the, the funding is already available, and the government to provide the security and those owners of the current land and to be allowed to exploit it for milk production purposes. Is government coming on board? Are you happy with what government is we, doing? We are very, in fact, the project I'm referring to, the second one, mm -hmm. we actually about a month or so ago, we had the opportunity to break the ground with the minister of lands uh, uh, and, and that that was very very encouraging uh, there was a lot of enthusiasm there was a lot of energy uh, around that that project we hope that we will continue to walk the talk and ensure that that rolls out because if it does it becomes a key attraction center for others to do similar a similarly structured product. So would you encourage young people to get into milk production, to own uh, uh, dairy head and that kind of stuff? Is it is it something that you would encourage? I, I, I would caution. I would caution. And the reason why I would do so is the risk of, it is to the risk of failure. You you don't want to encourage a young entrepreneur uh, whose little savings uh, will be devoted to dairy and it fails and, and burn up their investment. You don't want, you want them to move into areas where the risk of failure is minimal. And I will touch on to the potential areas for that. So the dairy industry tends to be very, very intensive, a knowledge intensive, financially intensive, a long gestation period. Now, those three issues, particularly the long gest the gestation period, means that the return on your investment is speaking to three to five years. The young entrepreneur may not have the, the patience to wait that long. That's why I, I would caution. But that's not saying they should not look into opportunities to invest. For example, if you are a young entrepreneur, your parents already have got a piece of land. It's closer to water which is a key ingredient needed for milk production. We are available as a company with our milk development uh, 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 unit to provide you with the necessary skills, uh, programs and business plans that can be put in place to make sure that your project does not fail. We already have done some few mm -hmm. with small scale uh, milk producers. But the, the progress 
it's a rather slow. Mm. How many have you taken? We, we currently, let me say, in terms of our milk supply, 11% mm. of our milk supply mm. come from small-scale uh, milk producers who benefited from our HAFA rehabilitation program. And, and, and that was successful to a limited extent, notwithstanding, of course, the challenges which I have already alluded to. Which could, we, could we have more programs of that nature that allow young people to get involved? In? You, you, need, you need it as an integrated okay. uh, program that speaks to starting with the genetics, right? The genetics must be appropriate. So right. let's let's look into your. That's interesting. At least there is an opportunity there mm -hmm. for those young people that are that are interested. Um, your the, the the results that we're looking at right now uh, reflect huge cost pressures on the business. Uh, you had uh, increase in revenue, quite commendable, of one hundred thirty nine percent, but you had one hundred twenty three percent in uh, in cost pressures. Which, but still, you managed to record a profit of uh, of 12, twelve million. So just explain those some of those cost pressures that that er eroded your your earnings. Okay, the, these are it's a, it's a, the, the the two jaws, the top jaw and the bottom jaw. The bottom jaw weighed down mainly the main cost driver is the exchange rate depreciation and you will see within the exchange rate depreciation the company had to pay in excess of eight million that relates to the procurement of foreign currency at the depreciating exchange rate right. and that's very very significant if we had not done that our margins could have been better than than at the level at which we recorded end of the year end of the half year of mm. course and um, so that was a big one. Then the second one, the disruption, the cost of disruption, which I've already alluded mm. to. Um, electricity, water uh, disruptions has been a significant uh, cost driver. Number three uh, is the cost of packaging, raw and packaging material. Again, relating to uh, the foreign currency and, of course, the internal uh, uh, Zimbabwe inflation factor. Um, those are the three main key headings which weighed down uh, 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 the, our margins. But on the other hand, you, you, you're, you are unable to pass most of the cost to the consumer and therefore eroding your, uh, your, your ability to be profitable. Explain that, discuss that, let's discuss that. Yes. Um, ordinarily, Trevor, uh, in an inflationary environment, if you move your prices within inflation, it is normal. Ordinarily, yeah. what is abnormal is the level of inflation, but that's a countrywide issue. Mm. At company level, so if you were to do that, you, 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 it is normal. We could not pass full inflation to the consumer, mainly because of uh, the erosion of uh, consumer, consumer spending power, their purchasing power parity, you know, eroding, and as a result. You can't just pass it on because you lose volume. When you lose volumes and you are also, your margins are being eaten by the cost push, the result is worse than, than perhaps taking smaller and regular below inflation price movement. Okay. Um, but still you're able to record uh, an, a net profit of 3.8 million compared to uh, 270,000 uh, last year, yeah. quite commendable. How did you do that? Well, I think, I think it's, like I said to you, it's the two, the two, the two jaws. jaws. The top jaw, which is your revenue, moving at 130, 139%, and the cost moving it lower than the movement of your, of your, of your revenue at 123. That gives you that... Uh, that contribution, that, that margin, uh, which we have referred to. Uh, so keeping an eye on those two uh, becomes a very critical, uh, uh, you know, dashboard issue. But over and above that, Trevor, you need to say in a, an environment in which you are losing value due to depreciating currencies, how do you preserve your balance sheet and shareholder value? Mm -hmm. So you need to restructure your balance sheet significantly. One is to invest in your inventory, forward investment, 
we did a significant forward investment in January on our inventory, which hedged against the price right, increases. Right. Right. And second, we reduced our exposure to foreign currency uh, from 4 million uh, at the end of December last year to about 1.8. And the reduction of that... Uh, How did you do that? We, 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 we took a decision to uh, source foreign currency, extinguish, expunge that, uh, that foreign debt. We, we had to do that. Obviously, our mind was focusing on what, trend, what is the trend of your exchange rate. We took a view that the exchange rate will continue to deteriorate. As it continues to deteriorate, if you remain as exposed as we were, it will eat big time into your p and and into your equity. I see you have focused on the export market and the result there has been also quite commendable. 24, 20, 244% growth in yeah. uh, uh, your earnings from uh, the export market to 1.2 million. How did you do that and which lines have... have, 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 have uh, given you those results? The, our, our biggest uh, uh, revenue driver on the export market is our long life milk, Chimombe, in Katun. Where now, is it going? It's going into Zambia. Mm -hmm. uh, it is going into Botswana. Those are the two key market we, markets we are into. Second is our steady milk. The sterile, sterilized milk, long life milk, find expression and favor in Mozambique. Uh, in, in Botswana, uh, as well as in Zambia. Third, we have what we call quick brew, that is our, our tea, um, into South Africa, into uh, Zambia, into Botswana. So those are some of the key uh, product lines which have been contributing. Then you also, interestingly, have um, foreign buyers, uh, guys who just walk in, and buy at the time when multi currency was, uh, was still a, a acceptable, acceptable, thing, acceptable to do. thing to do. They would come in and buy um, things like our Mayo and cross over into South Africa. Unbelievable. And, and we saw a big volume uh, moving in that direction. Are you formally taking, uh, pursuing that market? We are. We are now. What we're doing now is to establish uh, much more a credible route to market uh, via uh, what we call distributorships. And we've got a number of initiatives which we are working on mm. um, so that we can establish a much more permanent uh, presence in those, in those big markets. So we, we, with this uh, success that you've seen in the export market, uh, any other strategies to continue to grow into into the region and perhaps internationally? Well, I, I think I think we you know initially um, in 1997 when we were privatized, um, we adopted a very aggressive a growth strategy that looked into Africa, um, and 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 we we invested in in Malawi, we invested in Uganda for your information. But um, we had to beat Hest retreat from Uganda, um, where, of course, when we look back, uh, we, we were a little bit clumsy in terms of uh, uh, spreading your risk, uh, involving the local as well as ourselves. We took a view that uh, the winner takes it all, uh, and it didn't work and we had to exit. So you've learned lessons from that We've learned lessons from that experience. And yes. I see you are disinvesting from Malawi. The, How far is that process and why was it done? Right. The, okay, let me just quickly say to you, Trevor, um, at the height of um, hyperinflation in this country, right, up to 2008, 2006, 2007, 2008, the the unit, the business unit that carried us was the Good Malawi. Because Fascinating. it was generating foreign currency and we were able to get foreign currency from Malawi into Zimbabwe, convert into the then uh, local currency. And it carried the company. 
fast forward where we are now. Over the past three years, the economy in Malawi has been experiencing the same problems on foreign currencies as we are. As a result, we are not able to repatriate foreign currency to Zimbabwe. Second, reciprocal, Zimbabwe facing its own particular problems. We were not able to support our investment. As you know, Trevor, if you have got a subsidiary mm -hmm. and they have a little bit of fever, the parent company leverage its balance sheet to support the SBU and get out of the problems. Mm -hmm. So we needed to recapitalize the business. Right. Uh, with, that has been the case over the past three years, but not able to use our balance sheet, although it, we were able to, because of uh, exchange control, a uh, local exchange control cons constraints. So you've decided to cut your losses and run? So we decided to cut, uh, cut our losses mm -hmm. because we did not see light at the end of the tunnel. Um, the, you so are that was completed. That, that, that uh, divestiture was completed uh, end of uh, end of July and the Ugandan one we we, we we count our losses way back in 205 will you ever go back into the region in the manner that you have with the lessons that you've learned before? no I would approach it from a different perspective mm -hmm. your route to market in the region is in two two at two levels physical in presence physical investment or your brand penetration we think from a strategic point of view it makes more sense to invest in your brands, drive the brands into the regional market. Let them establish themselves. When they fully establish themselves, you can continue to engage the market, see the potential, the size of the market. That will then determine your investment decision. What we did was a, was a supply side push uh, instead of being led from the demand, demand side. So, of course, they are. Uh, those lessons mm. we have learned. You've yes. paid the school fees. You've learned the lessons. Oh, we have. Fascinating. <laughs> um, Anthony, you are a role model. Um, a lot of young people look up to you. What would you say to a young woman, a young man sitting at home without a job, feeling depressed and frustrated by the current economic environment? What would you say to that young person who's looking for a job? They've got a certificate qualifications what do you talk, say to them first and foremost i will i will disengage the young prospective entrepreneur from a state of uh, of uh, despondence i will encourage the young entrepreneur to look outside the box the problem that we face our youngsters face is that they want to move into a business which is four corner structured already. And that in itself is a huge, huge challenge. So what you should do, look very carefully to established business entities in Zimbabwe. There are a number of activities, Trevor, that we do as a Kanban dairy board. We should not be doing. We should be outsourcing, for example, um, we do distribution of our products. We have a mixture of direct distribution and in-source uh, certain distribution activities. Young entrepreneur who comes with a vehicle refrigerated suitable for our business, we connect with them and give them that opportunity to start small businesses which are anchored on large established businesses. So the young person out there, your challenge is to say, what is it that the dairy board is doing, which it ought not to be doing? And you then come and do it. That is the, the lowest cost entry into your business and guaranteed not to fail. Small, uh, but in leaps and bounds, you, you move forward. That's the kind of advice I that, will That's interesting, will Anthony, because it actually says we could start a movement led yes. by the corporate sector yes. um, to say we will, we will engage young men and women to 
gets the kind of business that can be outsourced. Yes, indeed, very true. The, uh, let me tell you another another area for dairy board. We do merchandising of our products into in formal trade. Um, those merchandising activities, dairy board can't be a corporate citizen to be doing that. It's a micro activity that can be done by young upcoming graduates from the universities uh, to start their own businesses. So why don't you get organized? Mm. And you look at um, central business area and say, look, we can do the merch merchandising for you, All right? It's volume based. The benefits to us at Dairy Board is we reduce our overhead cost and the cost is converted into variable cost. In turn, the young person who has come in who then takes over that variable cost has got a business model to start from. And eventually they grow into that. I'm just giving you a, as a one example. So we, we, th we think they must engage. They must engage. We must have avail ourselves as corporate you and I. leader. You and I, Trevor. We must avail ourselves to conversations with um, young upcoming entrepreneurs who would like to look at opportunities mm. of doing business. Mm. Right, so for the young men, at, young men and women at home, uh, Anthony is saying, uh, think outside the box, yes. look at the corporates, yes. see where you can go in and get uh, outsourced businesses. Don't uh, try and uh, go and start a fresh business from, from, from the start. That's very fascinating. Um, Anthony, I'm going to ask you to be uh, vulnerable now. Mm -hmm. Have you ever failed in anything? Yes, I did. And if you have failed, what were the lessons? What did you fail in and what were the lessons <laughs> that you got from, le from the failure? <laughs> there are too many things I have failed in my life. Right. Um, that's a good thing. So yeah. you've failed in life. I've failed That so has not times. stopped you from pursuing no. your dreams. No. In fact, if anything, the failure has been to me a stimulant, right, to scale on greater heights. It has been actually a construction pillar that says because you failed, understand why you failed. You know, sometimes to fail is a necessity to spare you to greater heights. So I failed. So many times. I mean, I can walk you through my journey. I mean, for the next two hours or so. I, I failed at all level. I, I, Trevor, I came out of all level with five subjects. And I failed distinctly, I remember. I failed three of them. Failed. Shona, history. Sorry for laughing, but uh, yeah. <laughs> I, I failed. And during that time, you would not proceed to do your A level without, you know, six O-level subjects. Mm. And to me, that was the first test in life that then said to me, so what? I could have wallowed in despondence and, and just like anybody else, but I took it up as a challenge and decided to do my own private studies and complete my, my O-level certificate that then allowed me to go to A-level uh, proceeded thereafter to university. So I'm, I'm saying that because I'm relating to the many youngsters who are out there who may find themselves stumble at all level, or even at a level for that matter. You must pull up your socks and, and take that as an opportunity to work hard. Let me fast forward and look at business. I've already told you uh, my experience in Uganda. That taught us a major lesson. One of them is that... Uh, you cannot construct a business model in an African country that aspires for economic empowerment of its people without involving its own people. Right. And you take the winner-takes-it-all mentality. Mm. It doesn't work. And that was a key lesson uh, that we learned, uh, we learned from, from, from so, so failure is never the end. No, it's only the beginning of better things to come. Um, let's move now to lastly your business outlook you are saying you are in survival and holding strategy yeah which means that it's not going to be any new investments um, you you basically holding fort 
uh, to see what's going to happen. What are going to be the key strategies that you're going to be looking into as you look at that survival and holding strategy? Right. The way, the way we, 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 we define the survival and hold strategy is to accept that within Zimbabwe, there are broader macroeconomic challenges that we face. And those macroeconomic challenges will weigh down business. We are already seeing that. The, the, the reduction in, in consumer spending power, which results in your volumes coming down, it's a key issue. So the survival strategy is how best can you hold your volumes at the current level uh, uh, to the year end. It's a critical issue. And you can't do it through a greedy, a greedy model that uh, seeks to uh, hyperinflate your prices. You, you have to take a haircut so that you are, you are modest in the manner in which you apply, apply your, your, your pricing. Second, you need to make sure that in terms of uh, the supply side to hold your volumes, that must be aligned. And therefore, the investment will be on the supply side, right? To spend a lot more time, more energy to generate particularly local milk production so that it fills in the twin strategic objective of import substitution and export generation. So it's the complete value chain assessment so that we hold it in a layman's language. We hold the balance sheet value to what it is as we pronounce it half year. So that come the end of the year, you can do your numbers and see that relative to the half year, the balance sheet has remained intact. I think that is absolutely critical. The, the key cobs, which are granular issues, then speak to how do you deploy your working capital. Your working capital in terms of sourcing for inputs, imported raw and packaged material, that forward aging, it becomes very critical. The powders are particularly critical. Riding on the commodity prices uh, to make sure that you strike when the cost is at the lowest, you then invest your local Zimbabwe dollar into foreign currency and procure the, those critical inputs is a very significant hold and a survival mode. It's hold and survival because we, we cannot be outlandish in terms of estimate and say we are going to grow uh, notwithstanding the national uh, statistics that doesn't make sense so what what is are there any specific issues that you would want government to do to attend to to make you slightly more um, uh, upbeat Mm -hmm. uh, bullish mm -hmm. in your engagement so that you are not in hold and survival mode. What are the key issues that you'd want to see coming from government? Okay, the, 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 the first one, Trevor, um, let's look at the key uh, shakers and movers on business. The first one is the availability of foreign currency. When the interbank market was introduced, industry and ourselves included, we were very excited about the benefits that comes via a credible a price discovery mechanism for exporters. And in turn, a credible mechanism for business to procure foreign currency. So we were very excited about that. Fast forward to the present day, we feel that uh, the interbank is not working as efficiently as we anticipated it to be. Obviously, there are overarching issues which need be to, be, to be attended to. The first one is that um, introducing the interbank without putting seed capital to nurture it, it certainly it does not result in the efficacy, full efficacy of the system being uh, 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 realized by industry. The second one is that um, you, you, you then have to address the issues of inflation. 
vis-a-vis -vis the depreciation of the currents. Now, government, at the level of government, the, the challenge is where is the foreign currency going that we are generating in the country? Right. Where is it going? And, and I think there is a need for transparency uh, to address that issue. Because it then feeds into the confidence issue. If, for example, I knew that this month I will get all my foreign currency requirements, I would be very modest in picking up price. Right. Yeah? Because I know I will get it. So what is the hurry? Why would I want to overburden my balance sheet with forward hedging? So that foreign currency which is being earned by the country mm -hmm. to the extent of 4.5 billion, 4.8, it ought to be explained to the business community where is it going mm -hmm. and how is it benefiting the overall economic... So there's no discourse. transparency. There's no One, transparency two, yet. the interbank market it, is not, not working. No, it's not. And then, of course, the, uh, the other uh, uh, monster in the house, so to speak, is the drivers of inflation. W what is driving that? It's a speculative behavior. When people are not confident, when they are not sure, they embark on speculation. And the speculation is the biggest driver of, uh, of inflation. And finally, I, I know, Trevor, you, you play a very critical role in terms of advisory uh, to, 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 to government. The issue of going forward requires a very robust communication system so that we as business people begin to see areas where progress is being made. It is important that where progress is being made, that communication feeds into the business, in the business And we are not seeing that communication. We are not seeing that communication. We, rather, we are seeing distorted communication messages. Anthony, I could listen to you the whole day. Thank you so much for this opportunity to come on to In Conversation with Trevor. We appreciate this. And uh, there's a lot of takeaways for young people wanting to get into business. And uh, so we're grateful for this opportunity. Thank you so much. Thank you, Trevor. Thanks for watching. Don't want to miss out on these insightful conversations. Subscribe to our YouTube channel.